Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our live cast on uh, Tuesday, April 28th here at uh, Toronto Rehab UHN. I am one of two hosts today. My name is Rob Bertelink. I'm a clinical, co clinical coordinator here at the program, and I'll be talking for about the first 10 minutes or so on how your heart works. And then after I am done talking, um, our co-host is our medical director, Dr. Paul O. And uh, he's gonna be talking about um, how to manage some of these problems that people will sometimes have with their hearts. So that is our plan for today. Hopefully you're able to uh, stick with us for the whole talk and uh, learn as much as you can. So just a couple of reminders. Uh, these sessions are for education purposes only. Uh, keep in mind we have quite a broad audience there and we have some young, some old, some complicated, some straightforward clinical patients. So it's very difficult for us to provide um, specific um, answers to any questions you might have. So we're gonna keep this general. And if you have any specific questions, the best thing to do is to uh, connect with your healthcare provider. Of course, they're gonna know you much better than I am, and they will be able to answer specific questions straight for you. We are gonna take some questions towards the end of uh, our session. Um, if you wanna ask your questions, don't raise your hand. You can see here on the little slide, there's a lovely option where you can put in Q and A, questions asked and answers. Uh, Dr. O and I will answer as many as we can during the live broadcast. Um, but if we do run out of time, anything that we have at the end, we'll try and make sure that we put them up at the ends. I'm just gonna see. Can everyone see that yellow box in the presentation? Lots of people can see it, um, but I have no idea how to get rid of that. Lace, if you're able to troubleshoot that with me, that would be wonderful. Okay, well, while my incredible IT support team tries to get rid of that orange box, um, I'm gonna keep going, all right? So by the end of the session, you will know. Um, one of the things that we know is the more you know about your heart and health and cardiology, um, the better you'll do long term. Uh, for me, I really don't like it when I ask people questions and they say, oh, I'm going to do this because Rob said so. Um, I'd much rather people do things because they understand them and they understand why. And they understand why we're asking people to do stuff. Um, generally speaking, if you understand why you're being asked to do something, you're more likely to do it and do it long term and you'll have better outcomes. So seeing as how we're a cardiac rehab program, we have a lot of people that come through with cardiac problems. So our session today is going to be talking a little bit about the heart, various systems within the heart, how they work. And then Dr. O is going to be talking about uh, what can go wrong and how to manage some of those problems. So that's kind of our goal. Hopefully you guys learn as much as we possibly can by the end of this. There we go. So what does the heart do? Every cell in your body needs a constant supply of oxygen rich blood. Um, the cells in our body use oxygen for a, very, a variety of processes, including making energy. And it's your heart's job to make sure that that supply of oxygen rich blood makes its way to the cells 24 hours a day, seven days a week for your entire life. So it's a very, very important job. It's pretty simple. It's only got one thing your heart has to do is supply oxygen rich blood, but um, it is critically important. So how does it accomplish that? We get our oxygen from the air that we breathe. So every time we take in a big lung full of air, the air goes into our lungs. And of course the air contains oxygen. Surrounding our lungs is a vast network of blood vessels full of blood. So what happens is oxygen will make its way from inside the lungs, through the lining of the lungs, and into the blood that's surrounding them. When this happens, of course, the blood is now going to become oxygen rich, full of oxygen. Oxygen rich blood is gonna make its way from the lungs and it's gonna to return to the heart. It's gonna enter into the upper left chamber of the heart. Now our heart has four chambers or four rooms. There's two chambers in the top that are called the atria. There's two chambers in the bottom that are called the ventricles. The right side of the heart, we very creatively have named the right, and the left side is called the left. So oxygen-rich blood leaves the lungs and enters into the upper left chamber of the heart, the left atrium. 
the left atrium then pushes the oxygen rich blood down into the bottom left part of the heart called the left ventricle. And the left ventricle is gonna push this oxygen rich blood out through the biggest blood vessel in our body. I'm sure you've heard of it before. It's called the aorta. The aorta is a pretty big blood vessel. It's about as big around as a loony or a toony. And the oxygen rich blood that goes out through the aorta is then going to make its way into a whole bunch of other blood vessels that spread throughout the entire body and this oxygen rich blood will go through this vast network supplying every cell in your body with oxygen rich blood. The cells are going to take this oxygen out of the blood, use it for energy, and when this happens your blood now becomes oxygen poor because it's had a lot of the oxygen pulled out of it. So the oxygen poor blood is now going to make its way back to the heart. It's going to enter into the right side the upper right quadrant, the right atrium. Right atrium is then gonna push this oxygen poor blood down into the bottom right side of the heart, the right ventricle. And then the right ventricle is gonna push oxygen poor blood back out to the lungs. And as the oxygen poor blood makes its way back to the lungs, we take another breath, we bring in another mouth full of air, full of, or another lung full of air, full of oxygen rich blood. That oxygen is gonna go into the blood again, making it oxygen rich and the whole cycle happens again. Believe it or not, your heart pushes blood around the body about 100,000 times every single day. So it's definitely one of the hardest working organs in your body. Very simple job. As I said, all your heart has to do is deliver oxygen-rich blood, uh, but if cells don't get oxygen, um, they're not gonna work so well. Deprive of them oxygen long enough, they're actually gonna die. All right, so heart's got to deliver oxygen-rich blood, and now we have a rough idea on how it does that. Next slide, please. Okay, now, um, obviously, I, I've just explained the heart does a great deal of work, and there's various components, parts, or systems within the heart um, that help it do all of this work. So I want to talk a little bit about the different uh, systems, and there should be four. Crystal, we've got one, push the button again, blood supply, electrical valves, and the muscle pumping, exactly. So those are the four systems that are gonna help the heart do all of its work. And I just wanna talk a little bit about them briefly so that we're all on the same page and have an idea in terms of how the heart is supposed to work. Because then when I turn it over to Dr. O, he'll be addressing those different systems and the the more, uh, the more common problems you'll see of supply. Next slide, Chris. Okay, uh, before we talk about that, that uh, the blood supply, I, I just said that um, we're gonna take a look at the main systems in the heart, and that'll make it a little bit easier for us to understand when Dr. O um, talks about problems. A lot of the time we'll refer to anything that goes on with the heart as heart disease. And heart disease is a pretty broad based term because there's lots of different things that can go on with the heart. So heart disease is kind of like the, the top umbrella term. And then we'll often break it down into different types of heart disease based on the system that the problem occurs in. So if you've got problems with your coronary arteries, the plumbing of the heart, that's coronary artery disease. Um, the heart's got an electrical system, that would be arrhythmias or electrical heart disease. Um, the valves are the doors in the hearts. Problems with that would be called valvular heart disease. And if you've got a disease with the heart muscle itself, the pumping part of the heart, that is called cardiomyopathy. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at these. And now, Crystal, next slide, we'll start off with the plumbing. So coronary artery disease is one of the most common type of heart problems that you'll see. I'm here in our cardiac rehab program. This is the most common referring diagnosis that we see. So what is coronary artery disease? Well, I said at the outset of this talk that every cell in the body needs a constant supply of oxygen-rich blood to function properly and to stay alive. And that is true for all of the cells that make up the heart as well. And the cells in the heart get their oxygen-rich blood through the coronary arteries. One of the things that can happen with the, the coronary arteries is if you damage the lining of a coronary artery, you actually create a, a little weakened area. And in that weakened area of the coronary artery, things can start to weaken it, deposit it, and start to build up in that weakened area of arterial wall. Whether it's excess cholesterol, white blood cells, smooth muscle cells, calcium, 
all this stuff can start getting deposited into this weakened or, or, or um, damaged area of arterial wall. And then you'll start to get plaque building up, which is what this graphic shows. You can see the, the yellow stuff building up more and more and more. As that plaque or blockage builds up, it leaves less and less room for oxygen-rich blood to travel down the artery. If you start to leave less room, you start to restrict the flow of oxygen-rich blood, parts of the heart muscle can start getting starved of oxygen-rich blood. If your heart muscle gets starved of oxygen-rich blood, it's going to complain. Um, it's not going to be able to do the, the, all the pumping work it's supposed to because it's not getting oxygen. And this is going to be a big problem. And if that happens, your heart will complain by causing a symptom called angina. So angina is a sign that your heart's not getting all the oxygen-rich blood that it needs. Most commonly, it's described as a pain or a pressure in the left side of the chest, radiating down the arm or up the left side of the neck into the jaw. It's not the only way that your heart can complain, but it's one of the most common ways that your heart will complain. All right, so this um, um, blood supply is often referred to as the plumbing of the, uh, of the heart. I know a lot of the time when I talk to patients about the different systems, I'll often relate it to a house. Many of us live in houses, so it kind of makes sense. We can all relate. Your house has got plumbing to get all the fluids and water around. Your heart's got a plumbing system just to make sure that it gets all the blood that it needs. And so problems with the uh, blood flow can be referred to as coronary artery disease, plumbing problems. So let's take a look at, uh, at the next uh, slide, please, Crystal. Okay, so your heart, believe it or not, has also got an electrical system as well. I mentioned earlier that your heart beats 100,000 times a day. Every single one of those heartbeats starts with a tiny little spark of electricity. So this is a picture showing a very, very basic, simple uh, representation of the electrical system in your heart. In the upper left, um, in the upper right chamber of the heart in the right atrium is a specialized clump of cells called the sinoatrial node or SA nodes. And your SA node is kind of like your heart's own natural pacemaker. This is where the electricity starts. Yes, um, the SA node will generate a little spark of electricity, which will pass over the top part of the heart, forcing it to contract. As the top part of the heart contracts, it pushes blood from the atriums down into the ventricles. And then in the middle of the heart, um, between the atriums and the ventricles is your atrioventricular nodes. It's also a specialized clump of electrical cells. When it senses electricity in the top part of the heart, it will pause for a fraction of a second, just long enough to let blood move from the top to the bottom part of the heart. And then it will generate an electrical impulse passing over the ventricles, getting them to contract and push blood out. So every heartbeat starts with an electrical impulse. Let's take a look at the next slide, Crystal. So if you have problems with the electrical system of your heart, you will have an arrhythmia, all right? And this is a very common thing that we see. Um, a lot of us know as we get older, stuff wears out, whether it's your, your knee or your back or your hip, um, things wear out as we get older. And so too can the electrical system of the heart. And as that happened, you might start getting irregular heartbeats, which means the electricity is going down um, non-normal pathways. Um, happens quite commonly to a lot of people, but if it happens too often, it can start to affect blood flow. And this can be a problem. And Dr. O, I'm sure we'll talk about what we can do about that um, in the second half of our talk. So we have um, a plumbing system, that's our coronary artery disease. And then we also have an electrical system. These are our arrhythmias. So we've talked about two systems. Let's take a look at the third one, Crystal. So I mentioned that our heart has got four chambers, the two atrias and the two ventricles, right side and left side. Um, it's important that the blood flows through the heart in a set you see, excuse me, in a set direction or a set pathway. Uh, to make sure that that happens, um, we have doors between all the different chambers of our heart. These are called the heart valves. We have them between the big blood vessels taking blood um, out of the heart, and we also have them between the different chambers. Now, um, as we get older, uh, the valves can start to get a little bit leaky. It's kind of like doors in a house. I mean, if you've got a brand new house, those doors are hung perfectly, they're square, they open and close flawlessly. 
But that's the whole part. Uh, as the uh, house gets a little bit older and starts to settle and shift a little bit, those doors don't maybe open and close as much. They get a little bit creaky. The valves in your heart are kind of the same way. You know, when we're born, hopefully those valves open and close perfectly, and they really control the flow of blood very, very well. But as we get older and stuff starts to wear out, those valves can get a little bit leaky, and you can have the flow of blood kind of can go back and forth across the, the valves themselves a little bit. These leaky valves are often called um, a regurgitation, you'll hear that term sometimes, or if you hear heart murmurs, that can be a sign that the valves are not opening and closing as well as they should. This results in your heart having to do an awful lot more work. Remember, in a perfect world, it beats 100,000 times per day. Blood goes through the different chambers beautifully. If those valves get a little bit leaky, the blood flows back and forth, your heart's got to do a lot more work. This can be very fatiguing, and fatigue and shortness of breath are common signs of valvular heart disease. So let's take a look at the next slide, Crystal. So this just shows a little bit of a closer look in terms of what valves look like, the different types of valves when they're open and closed. And if you take a look at the graphic on the bottom right that says normal and regurgitation, that shows my example really nicely. That normal valve, the valve doors are closing perfectly. There's no opportunity for blood to go in any direction other than the one it's supposed to. But the picture right beside it, you can see those doors don't really close as well as they should. And you can see there's a little bit of backflow of blood through the valve. And that's what they call regurgitation. That's what makes your heart do a little bit more work and can make you a little bit short of breath. Okay, so that's our third system, the valvular heart disease. And let's just take a look at this fourth one before I turn it over to my co-host, Dr. O. Um, we've talked about a plumbing system in the heart, the arteries. Uh, we've talked about the electrical system in the heart. Uh, we talked a little bit about the valvular heart disease, the doors in the heart as well. The last one, if we're going to finish off our, our relationship to the heart, is the walls. Um, house has got walls, so too does your heart. Uh, the walls of the heart are the pumping muscles that push all the blood all the way out to your fingertips, the tips of your toes. And you can have problems happening with the muscles of the pump as well. Um, probably the most common way to have a problem with the muscle of your heart is to have a heart attack. In a heart attack, you've blocked off the flow of oxygen-rich blood to part of the heart muscle for a long enough period of time that you've actually killed off part of that heart muscle. Um, a heart muscle is meant to, to, meant to move nice and smoothly and effectively pushing blood out very, very well. If part of the heart muscle dies, it's not as strong and it's not going to be pumping as efficiently. And heart attacks leading to what's called ischemic cardiomyopathy, probably the most common damage that you'll see to the heart muscle as well. Anything that can damage the muscle um, can cause problems. So heart attacks are common. Uh, sometimes you'll get toxins as well, whether it's alcohol. Um, high blood pressure can do it as well. If the valves are not working well, you can make the heart very, very fatigued and tired. It's not going to be working as well as it should in that particular case. So this is the fourth system that I'm sure Dr. O will talk about, and that's the plumbing system. A medical term for that would be cardiomyopathy. Okay, so that's a little bit about what the heart does, delivering oxygen-rich blood, 100,000 heartbeats a day, the four systems that help it do that massive amount of work. And now I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Dr. O, and he's going to talk about these problems a little bit more and talk about some of the more common solutions or treatment problems for that. I'm turning myself off and all, all yours, Dr. O. Great. Thank you very much, Rob, for a terrific introduction and overview of how normal heart function will go. Um, so my task for the next 10 to 15 minutes, will talk about some of the interventions that, that are offered up for these different aspects of the heart and um, hopefully touch upon some of the questions that might be of interest to the group. Uh, and I'm sure that there are a few uh, as we come to uh, issues that might hit close to home. Uh, this slide, you may recall, was, was an image that I showed uh, in last week's medication session. And it, we used it as a framework for talking about uh, when 
the arteries in our heart don't work so well and where we might apply some medication therapies. And um, uh, we thought that that might be a good touch point for us to think about how we might introduce some medication interventions and, and um, other kinds of issues uh, uh, as we move through. Um, we would be remiss, of course, since we are working in a rehabilitation program, however, to ignore, uh, or we should remember that we must not ignore, uh, the importance of life, so-called lifestyle approaches. You know, therapies, interventions that we hold near and dear to all of our hearts, and the very important impact of all of these uh, prevention rehab interventions, including getting active, eating better, feeling well overall, and um, understanding more about our own conditions, ultimately taking control of our health, which all of these represents the five program pillars of our rehabilitation prevention program, as it is for, for all rehab prevention programs uh, around the world. And, and there is really interesting data that have emerged that would say that if we can do all of these things correctly, along with taking the medications that have been prescribed to us, that we can achieve excellent heart health uh, through those uh, approaches, even without the needs for surgery uh, or angioplasty or other kinds of interventions. Now, in our mind, it's not one or the other, but in fact, if you combine it all together, you can do much better. So this slide it shows uh, for that same sort of plaque that's gone bad, and it reminds us that there are a number of medications that we can uh, offer up to, to manage our heart conditions, and this should be reviewed for most of you, uh, where we've talked about ways to uh, quote, thin out the blood, um, uh, think about the antiplatelet effects of preventing thrombus uh, using aspirin and other drugs like clopidogrel or ticagrelor or prazogrel. Thinking about how we can actually reduce the stress and, and, and um, the force and the, uh, the uh, excess activity of the heart using medications like the beta blockers that we know as the olols. Um, thinking about how we might manage the cholesterol plaque buildup within, this, within our arteries as so-called atherosclerosis using medications like statins as well as other lipid lowering therapies and using therapies that can relax the stress in the wall of our hearts using ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, the prills and the sartans. So these medications that you've been offered up uh, in the context of having had heart attacks or heart surgery or angioplasty or diabetes or high blood pressure, they all play a role in the therapeutic approach to things that can go wrong with our plumbing as Rob has introduced. But sometimes we'll need other kinds of interventions as well. And, and uh, about a third of us on the phone probably would have gone through a percutaneous coronary intervention. It made the short form may be uh, that you have heard called a PCI. Uh, percutaneous means that there has been a catheter that has been introduced through the skin into a blood vessel, either at the level of the wrist or the arm, or a catheter that was introduced in the groin into the femoral artery. Both of these interventions involve threading up a wire um, up towards the heart and approaching a blood vessel that has a blockage inside of it. Um, the other terms that you may have heard for this would be a coronary angioplasty. Angio refers to that blood vessel, and plasty refers to some sort of uh, intervention that causes a change in the size or the shape of that blood vessel with a balloon and other uh, sorts of tools that we'll show here. Now, if you want to see a little bit more animated graphic, you can go to the American Heart Association Interactive Cardiovascular Library. There is a link to that off of our Cardiac College website, where you'll see basically that if there is a blockage in a coronary artery that's, that's shown here with a stylized representation of the coronary angiogram, the cartoon here shows that there is buildup of plaque inside of this artery. And here, what's demonstrated is a wire with a balloon that's been passed across that narrowing. The balloons have been inflated and squashed against the wall of that artery and thus opening it up. Um, 
And 20 years ago, when coronary angioplasties were first done, that was basically the whole procedure where a balloon was inflated and the plaque was just squashed against the wall. Now, while it was effective for the short term, the observation was that uh, unfortunately, many of these vessels kind of collapse back down again. So the, the, the innovation in the last couple of decades has been to actually place a, another balloon with a metal stent in, inside of it and then uh, expanding that to hold the artery wall open. So this is now percutaneous coronary intervention with a stent that is left behind. And here's another representation of that in, in more colorful detail, demonstrating that the stent has been inflated, the atherosclerotic plaque has been squashed against the wall, and this wire and the balloon will be removed. Now, about half of you, if, of those of you who have undergone this kind of procedure and had a stent left behind in the artery, uh, you may have had one, two, or even more of these kinds of stents that have been placed. Uh, in Ontario at current date, uh, about half of these stents will be made of plain metal or bare metal stents. And about half of these stents will have had some sort of medication uh, attached or impregnated onto the, 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 the wires of that artery or of that stent that then slowly come out into the artery over the course of the next several weeks to a few months. And the idea of that medicated stent or drug eluting stent, eluting meaning that the medication is coming out very slowly, is that it calms down the reaction that may follow having undergone one of these uh, stenting and ballooning procedures so that there is a less of a tendency to scar formation. Whether you've had a plain metal stent or a drug eluting stent, you'll be offered up some medications to reduce the amount of platelet that, that, that attacks to this uh, or, and, and uh, the tendency to form blood clots. And we did discuss that last week uh, in our medication session. Now, uh, for some time, in some situations, the artery size, shape, nature of the blockages, or uh, if there are multiple blockages in, in many arteries, the decision may instead be made to move to a coronary artery bypass operation. And, and, and this cartoon demonstrates that in this section of the heart that's in the box, that if there is a blockage that is shown here, that the idea is that one can do a bypass operation through an open heart procedure, either through a full uh, kind of opening of the chest or through smaller incisions. And the idea is that there is a small a bypass graft, a, a tube that may com com be comprised of a vein removed from the artery of the leg uh, or actually an artery um, from the inside of the chest wall, and that re represents the bypass that goes from the main large uh, vessel, the aorta that, that Rob introduced to you, that will be taken down past the level of the blockage and connected into the downstream section of that artery. So that is what is meant by the bypass. Essentially, we built a new road that brings oxygen-rich blood down to the muscle of the heart where it is needed. Now, uh, here uh, shows uh, someone who's had two bypasses, and uh, the, the, the standard approach these days is to take one of the veins from the leg and, and put it down into the right coronary artery if, if there is the blockage in the right, and then taking the internal mammary artery off the inside chest wall and plugging that into the major blood vessel that supplies uh, oxygen-rich blood to the heart muscle, the, the um, left anterior descending artery. And if there are other bypasses needed to other blood vessels in the heart, that may be a combination of veins uh, and other conduits like uh, taking out the artery uh, from uh, one of the wrists, either on the left or the right side, and using that as another bypass vessel. And it's not uncommon for people to have three or four or even five of these bypasses uh, done at one time uh, at one of these surgeries. So that's uh, addressing the plumbing sorts of issues. Um, and if you've got any questions about that, if you'll add them to the Q&A uh, section of the, uh, of the platform, then we'll pick them up as we move along.
the second part was the electrical abnormalities that may occur over time. And, and Rob introduced to us that the heart has an electrical system to it that consists of wiring very similar to uh, what might be happening through the wires of your house. Um, and, and what we've also uh, kind of discovered is that it's not uncommon, just like the wires in your house may wear out over 50 or 60 or 70 years, uh, if you actually take the drywall wall off of your wall and look at those wires, you'll say, hmm, uh, you know, whatever metal was used to conduct, uh, conduct uh, electricity at that time may not be the greatest. It might be knob and tube kind of wiring. You may have gotten some squirrels or rats in your walls that have chewed up some of the wires. So it's not uncommon then to need some sort of replacement uh, for the electrical system uh, in, in the body as well. And what this uh, illustration uh, kind of uh, tries to show us is what happens if the wires have been uh, developed some sort of short circuit and electricity is not being transmitted properly through the heart. Well, we would understand if there's a fracture and electricity doesn't conduct, then our heartbeats may go excessively slow. And if the heart goes slow, as Rob said, then the blood doesn't flow very, uh, very briskly through the heart. Um, and it may lead to pauses where you don't get enough blood through the rest of the body. You might actually pass out. Uh, the medical term for that is called syncope. Um, or if the heart doesn't respond in the way that you want it to when you're trying to exercise, if it remains very slow, then you're just not going to get enough pep and not enough blood flow and not enough oxygen delivery. So to come to the rescue for that, uh, some very smart folks over time have built these uh, somewhat simple but very elegant electrical pacemakers. So there is something that is the, the size of a couple of loonies. I would have said in old days this was the size of a cigarette lighter, but of course we don't have those anymore, do we? Um, and a large part of that pacemaker consists of a battery device that lasts for many years. There is also something like a mini computer inside that can process electrical signals. And there are one or two wires that would go to the heart. And these are called leads of the heart. That, that can detect the ECG signals, number one, so they can read electrical signals, and number two, they can also deliver an electrical impulse wherever needed. So if the wires are sensing that the, the heart rate is going too slow, it feeds that back to the mini computer pacemaker, and the pacemaker says, I agree with you, you are going too slow, let me send some electrical juice down my wires so that the heart will speed up. And, and this illustration of electrocardiogram tracing uh, shows uh, where an electrical pacemaker might have taken over. The red arrows refer to pacing spikes, that sharp little spike that is followed with the electrical signal that travels down the wires of the the native wires of the heart. So that represents an electrical signal that corresponds to a heartbeat. And you'll see in this case for this person that the pacemaker is firing off every time and that is what is driving this rate uh, for this individual and keeps the heart flowing along, uh, which, is, which is very nice. Now, a more sophisticated way of dealing with this, uh, if there are other kinds of electrical abnormalities in the heart, um, so not only might the heart go too slow, but sometimes there are short circuits within the electrical system that lead to fast rhythms or irregular rhythms or sometimes very dangerous rhythms. So a souped up version of the pacemaker is something called an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. So implantable refers to the fact that this little device will be inserted just underneath the skin and muscle on the heart, on the chest wall. The wires are placed down the subclavian artery, the artery that just sits below the, the collarbone. And then these wires are placed down to the heart. Now, these kinds of cardioverter defibrillators can also do that pacemaking function. So if the heart is too, going too slow, the little computer in the ICD uh, battery pack will We'll sense that it can deliver um, extra beats to make sure the heart is going fast enough for the activities that we want. But it's also got more sophisticated ways of reading the heart rhythm through these leads that might sit in the right atrium and the right ventricle. And if it detects in particular that there is a very dangerous rhythm that's arisen, and this ECG strip shows 
a, a, a marked contrast between the left-hand side, where there is this wide, bizarre, irregular sort of heart rhythm. And in this case, this is called ventricular fibrillation. That means the heart's trying to stop. And if that is detected by this very smart uh, cardioverter defibrillator, then a strong shock will be delivered to the heart. And then that'll reset the whole electrical system and uh, re allow return, hopefully, to a nice regular sinus rhythm. You know, some of us online will have had one of these sorts of devices implanted. Somebody may have even had one of these kind of shock episodes, but the idea is that it can be very uh, life-saving, in fact, um, uh, so that we don't live or, or, or experience these kinds of irregular heartbeats. So these ICDs are, are a smarter version of this, and this is the shock function. Some of these kinds of ICDs can also sometimes pace us out of dangerous kinds of heart rhythms as well. Um, let me just look at a couple of questions here that are relevant to this part. Uh, and one of uh, the folks on the phone is asking, what is considered a heart beating too slow? Uh, and, and that's a great question because for many of us, we're aware of our heartbeats. We may have been trained to check our pulses and monitor that along. Uh, a heartbeat may be slower than 50 or 40 beats uh, per minute uh, for, for many individuals. Although some of us may leave, live with heartbeats in the 50s and 60s and be quite fine, if we're up and walking around and getting lots of blood flow, not feeling dizzy, that's not an issue. Um, and we may have had some sort of heart tracing or heart recording over time where we've monitored whether that's gone too slow. But if it's falling below 40 beats per minute consistently, and if we're also getting long pauses in our electrocardiogram, that may be a sign that we need one of these backup pacemakers. And if ever these kinds of dangerous heart rhythms are picked up, then that's when we might need one of these cardioverter defibrillators. Okay, I'm gonna move on with just a couple more sections and then we'll move to the questions. Thank you very much for submitting them along and we're accumulating a good, uh, good number of items for our question and answer period. Rob has described that sometimes our valves may um, go, um, uh, go awry over time. The doors may not fit very well. The windows may not sit in their frames particularly well. And we have different approaches then to how to replace those doors and, and windows. Uh, and what this uh, uh, illustration from the Mayo Clinic is representing that one of the new approaches to creating new doors is actually to insert a new one right in the frame where it kind of sat. Um, and, and there's kind of modern approaches where you may not actually have to open up the whole chest wall to remove one of those valves. So now there is this so-called transcatheter, meaning that a uh, wire um, uh, will be placed up to the heart, uh, across the skin, into the uh, puncturing one of those blood vessels, particularly the femoral artery in the groin, and that can be threaded up and placed here into the aortic valve position. So you'll see the balloon and that little brown meshy sort of thing represents where the new valve will be seated in uh, to the position of the old valve. This can be done from the groin upwards. It can also be done uh, with a catheter that is introduced directly into the aorta. Um, and it can also be introduced through the chest wall through making a puncture, small puncture in the heart, and then thread it up as well. And what this allows to happen is that um, from this, this set of cartoons represents the catheter coming down uh, and coming across the stenotic aortic valve, the balloon in the valve is, is seated right across that valve structure, and then the catheter and the wire and the balloon are removed, and what's left is this little um, new valve, it almost looks like a crown, that's sitting there, and that will look, control the blood flow smoothly out of the heart and into the aorta. So that's called a transcatheter aortic valve, and, and these are being done with increased frequency uh, all across the world, uh, and the nice thing about these is that you don't have that whole recovery time of the open heart surgery. Now, not everybody uh, will be suitable for having one of these valves based upon the anatomy uh, and um, 
and just the complexity of getting one of these valves in place so that some people are still having surgical valve operations. And what this is going to involve, of course, is a, a larger incision uh, through the breastbone of the chest and then opening up and actually visualizing where the heart might be, making an incision in the aorta, looking at where the valve is sitting in here in this lower left cartoon, that valve is shown as something that is degenerated over time, built up calcium, so it doesn't open and close particularly well. Here we're seeing uh, in the upper right that the old valve is being removed surgically. The middle here is this new valve that's being uh, sutured into place and will be dropped down here. You can see that it requires a very skillful surgeon and there's amazing surgeons that can do these operations and then that valve is brought into place with multiple stitches. These valves may be composed of tissue um, like they're, they're, some are made out of, uh, of cow tissue or, or, or other animal kind of tissue. Uh, there may be some of these valves that are made of, of um, of metal or other kinds of, of um, new engineered materials uh, and placed down into position. And here you can see that essentially the new valve has now uh, taken place of the old valve that is, isn't functioning very well. So the choice of whether one in, uh, has one of these transcatheter procedures or the surgical open procedure depends on your own history, what's, been, what's gone on in terms of the, the progression towards um, the, the narrowings or, or problems with the valve, the rest of your health and how well you might withstand one of these open heart surgeries versus one of the balloon surgeries. And then thinking about the future of how long these valves might last in these kinds of positions. And then finally, there may be considerations on medications that are necessary after one of these valves goes in. So if one uh, wants to avoid taking strong blood thinning medications, for instance, then having a, a new tissue valve put in place may allow for less need for blood thinning. But if one wants a long duration durable kind of valve, then metal may be the way to go, but then that will need uh, the use of warfarin as a blood strong blood thinner over time. So lots of interesting considerations and you may have um, that kind of discussion with your uh, uh, cardiac surgeon and cardiologist. Now, finally, moving to the last part of the pump problems that, that Rob introduced to us, that um, if the heart pump is starting to develop some troubles, then we can think of some different approaches. And I'll just introduce a couple uh, very quickly to, to spur on the discussion. The major approach to a heart that's not functioning particularly well is with medications on top of all the lifestyle approaches. So if you are living with heart failure or cardiomyopathy, as, as Rob has introduced, then um, there's a number of medications that help change the balance and physiology of the heart system, as well as um, medication approaches that have proof to reduce hospitalization, improve quality of life, and re reduce other bad outcomes from happening. And the medication approaches might be lumped into this way of how the heart kind of balances out with all the rest of the blood vessels and the kidneys also play an important role in maintaining salt and water balance in the body. And I think, I think we're understanding that kind of relationship. So with the heart, if it's not functioning as well as it might be, then the ways that we might help out the heart are to really slow it down and relax it so it's not so stressed out because that's what the heart is told to do when it's not functioning particularly well. We, we try to kick it up and, and, and try to force it to work harder. So in medications like the beta blockers that we're familiar with managing some of the plaque that's gone bad is also very helpful for the heart that's also been knocked around. And if we can introduce some of these beta blockers or the OLAL drugs very carefully um, and build up the levels there, then the heart will function in a more relaxed and coordinated way and it will function better and, and push out more blood. 
And then if we can reduce the amount of stress in those blood vessels using medications that are familiar to us, like the ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers, we know them as PRILs and SARTANs, one or the other, and sometimes they're combined with other new drugs, then the idea there is that we can take some stress out of the system, then the heart doesn't have to work quite as hard. And then finally, thinking about where the kidneys are functioning, if we can push blood out from the heart through the blood vessels and have them filtered by the kidneys down here and reduce excessive amounts of salt and water through the use of diuretic tablets, such as furosemide or spironolactone or other agents like this, then we can create a more calm system that doesn't have too much salt and water, doesn't have the heart working excessively, doesn't have our blood vessels squeezing down excessively, and that's a calmer way of managing heart failure. Now, finally, because we are talking about some sorts of procedures and interventions, some of the newer interventions might be use of these sorts of, uh, of mechanical devices that are called left ventricular assist devices, or LVAD for short. And essentially here, if the pump isn't working as well as it can, and the medications don't seem to be cutting it to help the heart function and beat uh, and reducing stress in the system, then sometimes an external pump uh, or, or a mechanical pump that gets implanted. And here you'll see that there is part of the pump that goes actually inside the chamber through this um, uh, sort of uh, a mechanical pump that pushes blood up to the aorta. So it kind of bypasses the need for the pump to function very well. In fact, the uh, mechanical device will, will push this along. So that's the part that's inside. On the outside, this of course will need a very strong battery to push this along. And then there is tubing that goes uh, from uh, uh, an implant at the surface of the abdomen all the way up to the heart. So this is called the drive line and, and the mechanical battery that, that goes outside of this. Um, so people are going home with these devices and this may take over some of the heart function over time. And sometimes these devices are used as ways of buying time until the ultimate uh, kind of therapy for a heart that, that's not functioning as well as it might be is to actually transplant a new heart into the system. Okay, so we have covered a lot of territory about new heart or the, the way the normal hearts work from plumbing to electrical to valves to electricity and then gone over a lot of territory on things that can be done. Now let's turn to you and, and some of the questions that might come online. And Rob and I might uh, take um, uh, uh, turns at answering some of these questions. Um, and maybe Rob, to you, if, if you can see those Q&As, um, the first question uh, that's coming up is, you know, in your opinion, is there one kind of heart disease that might be the hardest to solve or where people might be having the most, most difficulty over time? Um, well, it's kind of interesting. I, I know a long time ago when I was first uh, hired in here, they used to say that, you know, coronary artery disease tends to be a lifestyle disease. So coronary artery disease, I don't think is going to be the hardest to solve, but there's an awful lot of lifestyle stuff you can do to improve on that. So I don't think that would be the hardest. Um, electrical system. So Problems with the electrical system can, can come about um, a little bit through lifestyle. Like if you have a lot of cigarettes, um, that can cause rhythm problems. So that could be a lifestyle change you could make. Um, so that might work. Valvular heart disease. I think valvular heart disease would probably be the one that I'd say is hardest to solve. Not a lot of lifestyle stuff can impact on uh, valvular heart disease. As Dr. O illustrated, Quite, quite nicely, a lot of the time you're looking at surgical uh, approaches. So I think I'm gonna pick on something that's either gonna be valvular heart disease or maybe the cardiomyopathies. That would be my answer. Yeah, and I, I agree fully, Rob, that um, uh, you know every disease may be difficult for some individuals. Uh, the, the other part I will say though, is that many people do live um, uh, for many, many years and be fully productive and active with any one of these sorts of conditions. Um, so the, the great thing that we've been seeing, you know, probably every year there, there, there's, there's new innovations and there's, there's innovations that we haven't described yet uh, in, in this session. So, so thank you for that. Um, 
the next question coming up uh, is, uh, do stents need to be replaced over time, Rob? Um, so generally speaking, the stents that we put in are going to outlast us. Uh, most of the stents that we're putting in right now are metal. Um, I, I think, Paul, I have read that they're looking at some kind of biodegradable stents, but I know that's still a little bit farther away. Um, so stents generally don't need to be replaced, but just because you have a stent put in doesn't mean you can keep, um, you know, having an, a heart unhealthy lifestyle. It is possible to still develop blockages within the stent. So it's important that you lead a heart healthy lifestyle, exercise regularly, um, control your risk factors, eat right, and of course, make sure you take your medications. And if you do that, um, hopefully you won't develop any more blockages within your stent. Yeah. Uh, agree completely. And maybe, maybe the other nuance on this is that once the metal stent goes into the artery, it stays there. Um, so it's not like the stent really needs to be replaced, but it's problems that will arise in those arteries that needs new stenting to be done. Uh, and that might be new blockages that can be kept away, as, as Rob indicates. Or sometimes there are problems that develop inside of the stent, not the stent itself, but the, but the, the, the cells, the, the thrombus or the, or the plaque that may regrow uh, are, are within or just around that stent. And that's why we hear about people going for new stenting procedures. Paul, that leads us into uh, the next question, I think, quite nicely from Leslie. If the valves require an operation, does that last forever or has to be done every few years, Dr. O? Yeah, so um, in, in the case of valves, um, you know, some will, will last a very long time and, and um, valves are designed to last years and sometimes decades uh, for individuals. But, you know, for some individuals, uh, who are born with a valve narrowing, so-called congenital heart valves, if, if there's narrowing at, at a relatively young age, like 40 or 50, uh, you may have to anticipate that more than one operation will be necessary over time uh, so that there is some wear and tear and, and, and repeat surgeries may be necessary to replace those heart valves. What about, Paul, I'm going to flip this one to you. What about patients with um, stents and pacemakers? Of course, they're going to be made out of metal. And the question here is surrounding um, how do you have an MRI done if you've got uh, stents or pacemakers inside your body? Yeah, so that's a great question. And we know that MRI scanning uh, is being used to look at various parts of the body. Um, the, the short answer is with stents, uh, the coronary stents, usually that's actually not a problem having one of these MRI scans because they're so small and uh, they really don't interfere with the MRI. Pacemakers are going to be another, uh, another issue. Uh, now, some of the newer ones, there actually may be less interference of the MRI with the pacemaker and the pacemaker with the MRI. So, so do check that out when you get the devices in and um, uh, and see uh, what, what, which devices might be compatible with more advanced scanning. Why don't you take this next one, Rob, about um, if, if one has a heart problem and you're trying to get out walking and you might experience some discomfort either in the check, chest or neck, and how, how might you deal with that vis-a-vis um, -vis physical activity? Well, if, if you're a cardiac patient or any kind of patient, really, and you're starting to exercise and you start getting some, some pain, any kind of discomfort, um, it's important that you try and figure out what, what's causing that pain. So if you've had valve surgery and you're getting some exertion-related symptoms, probably the first thing to do would be to hold off on the exercise and just reach out um, to your doctor just to make sure that the pain you're getting is part of the healing process. And with a lot of the valve surgeries, especially if you have to open up the entire chest wall, there is a healing process involved and you might have a little bit of discomfort and that's perfectly normal. But it's important that you talk to your own doctor to figure that out. Now, assuming that this is part of the uh, healing process, usually what we encourage people to do is if you're walking and you get a little bit of discomfort, um, typically try and slow down a little bit. Um, let the discomfort tend to pass. Um, and if it passes, then you can slowly build things back up. Exercise really should be comfortable in the early days after uh, having any kind of cardiac problems. 
Um, so you really want to make sure that when you are exercising, you're pretty much symptom free. That would be my suggestion, I think. Dr. O, would you agree with that? Uh, I agree. Um, the, the other thing that we might bring up is that if you are being monitored with a, with a valve narrowing, if you've never had a surgery, for instance, and they've said, let's just watch this over time, uh, developing discomforts uh, in the chest or elsewhere, maybe one of those first warning signs that says, hmm, maybe this valve is actually giving us a little more trouble now. We might have to think about doing something else like a surgical intervention. Perfect. Paul, I'm going to tackle this next one. I like Great. these collateral blood vessel questions. Lovely. From Brent, he asks, I am a bit unclear of the role of collateral blood vessels. Are they a result of having an active lifestyle or do they develop in response to having heart disease to provide an alternate path to provide oxygen rich blood when arteries become blocked? Um, so great question. So what are collateral blood vessels? Well, we have quite a supply of coronary arteries. Um, our coronary arteries are meant to supply the entire heart muscle with all the oxygen rich blood that they need. Now, if something happens such that that supply starts to get restricted a little bit, it would be in our heart's best interest to see if they could find or maybe grow new blood vessels to further increase the supply of oxygen rich blood. Um, sometimes people will call this um, lay bypass or natural bypass. Basically what your heart is doing is it's growing tiny new little blood vessels to supply different parts of the heart muscle with needed oxygen rich blood if the supply is compromised in any way. These tiny blood vessels are what we would call collateral circulation or collateral, um, collateral blood vessels. Most commonly we would see them in people that do have coronary artery disease. So their supply of oxygen rich blood to the heart muscle has been restricted, um, but they still continue to lead an active lifestyle. Exercise is fantastic for so many reasons. Um, if you exercise and you lead an active lifestyle, that's sending a message to your heart, hopefully on a daily basis that, hey, we need oxygen rich blood. And if you're not able to uh, deliver all that oxygen rich blood, the heart needs to restructure itself in terms of growing new blood vessels to supply that oxygen rich blood. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, it's one of the many, many benefits of leading an active lifestyle that involves exercise. Terrific. What about what about this next question here, Paul? How does myo myo well the question is myopericarditis fit into this discussion? Yeah, terrific. Thanks, Rob. Um, so I think this will be the last question that we'll take, and then there's a few more that um, that we'll uh, address um, uh, through the usual uh, responses through the written documents and posting. Uh, but myopericarditis, so we've talked about the house, uh, and maybe this actually speaks to the, the fence that might go around your house. So there's a lining around the heart called the pericardium. So peri means around or outside, uh, cardium, the heart. Uh, and there are some situations where there might be inflammation uh, angry red redness swelling of the of that lining sometimes this relates to infections like viruses sometimes it can be related to some medications and some people might experience this angry healing reaction after having had a surgery um, and it's characterized by having pain uh, sometimes very intense discomfort, shortness of breath, um, and sometimes it can trigger irregular heartbeats and things like this. The usual uh, sorts of intervention are to take some anti-inflammatory medications. Classically, that would be aspirin or some other kinds of uh, anti-inflammatory arthritic medications to try to calm things down. Um, so uh, occasionally there might be some fluid accumulation with that. So it's one more uh, part of the heart, you know, not the most common conditions that, that we're going to be presenting with, uh, but an important consideration. Okay, so um, wonderful. Thank you for your comments. I'm sorry that we're not going to get to everything at the moment, but we will, of course, uh, address your questions uh, in, the, in the next little while. Uh, coming to the top of the hour, uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this session. And if you want to learn more about what heart disease is and what you can do about it, go to the Cardiac College website and go click on the Treat Heart Disease tab to learn more. You'll see some useful 
information, some, an, uh, some, some good graphics, as well as some useful links to animations if, if you like to watch more video. So uh, we hope that you've enjoyed this session. I was very uh, glad to be able to uh, chat with Rob today and, and present this to you. He's always a phenomenal presenter uh, and uh, I think uh, has presented great information for you. We'll remind you that uh, Wednesdays are our Nutrition Wednesdays and tomorrow's session is on how to choose some heart healthy foods and we need to make these decisions every single day. One more other innovation that we'd like to bring for, to you as part of the Cardiac College Online series is a special seminar uh, series on women with heart. Uh, so specialized topics that have been chosen based upon feedback from uh, our, our women uh, in the program. And these will start Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock starting next week May the 5th. So tune in Tuesday morning, 10 a.m., uh, same, same, uh, same points of entry for us. Um, and we're actually going to be starting with a live demonstration of resistance exercise class. And three of our team members who are familiar to you as case managers will be leading that session. So be ready to exercise and there will be appropriate types of programs for all levels. So great uh, to be able to bring some more of these innovations to you. So thank you very much for, for joining us today. Uh, continue uh, to be well, and we'll look forward to connecting in real soon. Thanks very much.